Tonight, we're going to be talking about quercetin. This is another wonderful molecule um, that I'm going to go in-depth in training. We're going to cover the history, its uses, where it's been used before. We're going to go over some science on why this molecule isn't very effective in normal or typical dietary supplements. And then we're going to go into some science behind it. And just to uh, start off here, my training tonight uh, is not intended to treat, diagnose, cure, mitigate any disease. I'm not going to be talking specifically about any product. I am going over a particular molecule, a flavonoid known as quercetin. And that's what I'm training on tonight. And I encourage you guys to um, get online. Uh, in fact... Uh, I'm having some of our uh, uh, advisory board members post specific uh, clinical studies that I've researched out and found to be a benefit. Uh, and as I'm talking about this particular molecule, they're going to be posting links to some of the clinical studies out there on this molecule called quercetin. I want you guys to read through those links. And you know what? Better yet, Go out and find out what you can find out there about quercetin because uh, what I'm going to be covering in just 30 minutes tonight is in no way going to like give you an in-depth education on that molecule. I'm not saying you need to have an in-depth education on the molecule. It's just if you're fascinated by these molecules like I am and you love the science like I do, um, in all honesty... I didn't study each and every one of these molecules while I was in school. Most of my training and education was after uh, I had gotten my degree and through my own personal training and experiences. So um, you guys can teach yourself all about these molecules and you can learn a, as much of them as you want, as much as I know. You don't need a degree to do that, okay? So if you're fascinated by it, then... Um, study it too. Uh, Ginger, somebody just asked if I could spell it. Yeah, I'll spell it out. Uh, and I believe I put it in the title too. So when it is, when it does go live on Facebook, you're going to see it uh, up at the top. It is Q-U-E-R-C-E-T-I-N, quercetin. It's a pretty common, in fact, it's one of the most common flavonoids found in our foods. And I'm going, we'll, we'll go ahead and start the training right now, but the word quercetin itself uh, comes from quercetum, which is a Latin word meaning oak, an oak forest actually. Uh, the Latin name for quercus is uh, the oak tree. So when you look at Latin names for a variety of different oaks, they all have quercus in them. Now, why is that important? Well, it's because quercetin is quite commonly found in the bark of the oak tree. In fact, it's fairly high concentrations, about half a percent, which is a pretty high concentration. However, most of the quercetin, the, we don't go around eating uh, tree bark, right? Especially from oak trees. But we do get quercetin in decent quantities from our diets. In fact, I'm going to, oh, and by the way, quercetin, I did forget to say, is a yellowish compound. So a lot of the foods that I'm going to name off here that are on my list will have yellow pigments. And, and you, when I name the food, you may not think it's yellow, but it is. And there is an interesting way to find out, by the way, the pigment of a food. For example, uh, many of us think purple cabbage is purple. And so we assume, uh, in science, we assume that it's a proanthocyanidin, which is the purple coloring in like grapes, uh, blueberries. Anthocyanidins are these kind of dark red, beautiful purple hues that we get in our fruits and vegetables. And so when you see a purple cabbage, you think it's a purple. But just chop up that cabbage. In fact, this is a fun experiment to do. I'd love for you guys to chop up a red cabbage or a portion of a red cabbage, put it in a white, like plastic bowl. I say white because I want you to see the contrast in color. And then just put cold water in it and let it soak overnight. When you wake up in the morning, you'll be super surprised what you see. 
you do not see purple, you see blue. A purple cabbage is actually blue, which blue is of the, um, uh, oh my gosh, I can't believe I just forgot this. The endol family, sorry. Uh, endols are from cruciferous uh, veggies, and endols are blue. Anyway, quercetin is a yellow, uh, and so take any of these plants that I'm going to read here, any of these foods, and chop them up, throw them in a white plastic bowl or something overnight, and let them soak for a, a day or so, and you will see the yellow pigment in the water when you're done, even though the plant itself might be red or some other color. But just to let you know, you know, it, it is said, it's well known that quercetin is high in our diet and highly concentrated in our diet. But I'm going to read to you the plants that quercetin is high in, and then you tell me if you're eating these foods or not. Uh, and if you're not eating these foods, chances are you are deficient or not getting enough quercetin, all right? I can't really say deficient because quercetin is not a vitamin, but look, these phytochemicals are essential for life. We know they're highly beneficial to uh, prevent a myriad of, of diseases and uh, to support optimal health and things like that, but they're not considered vitamins, meaning that they're vital life. All right, let's read on. Capers. Uh, lovage leaves. Dock or sheep sorrel. Uh, radish leaves. Carob fiber. Dillweed. Coriander. Yellow peppers. Fennel leaves. Uh, red onions. Radicios. Watercress. Kale. Choke cherries. Uh, bog blueberries. Buckwheat. Cranberry. Lignanberry and black plums. Those are the highest concentrations of quercetin in our diet. I went through that list and there's like three of those items that I eat on a fairly regular basis that I get maybe three or four times a week. Okay, that's it. I, get, I eat onions probably four times a week. I eat kale maybe four times a week. Uh, yellow peppers I do quite often, three or four times a week. But that's about it. Uh, and so, you know what? I think we all could use more quercetin in our diet. And a dietary supplement is nothing more than supplementing your diet, right? So if you can't or don't want to eat any of those things, you can always take a dietary supplement. So let's move on. Um, the quercetin that is found in most dietary supplements today is mostly extracted from onions. Onions we produce in vast quantities. Onion has fairly high concentrations of quercetin. And so we get uh, most of the raw materials that are used in the dietary supplements when somebody's formulating with quercetin it is an onion extract that would contain anywhere from 2% to 20% quercetin. And then we just kind of, oh, and or um, tea leaves are also higher in quercetin. So the quercetin might come from onion, it might come from tea leaves, but it's going to be one of those two. But here's an interesting fact about quercetin, you guys. And this is why I love studying phytochemicals and plants and all this stuff. Quercetin is less than 1% bioavailable to humans. So even with eating all of this stuff, you know, you're only getting microgram doses because it, even if it's in an onion at a fairly high concentration and you eat five onions a day, you're only getting maybe four or 500 micrograms of quercetin. And by the way, all the clinical studies for like health benefits of quercetin are between the 25 and 50 milligram range. So that's hundreds of times more than micrograms. And it's just because quercetin is not very bioavailable. So the interesting thing is, is during the COVID pandemic, 
Quercetin became widely popular in dietary supplements, and it was in a lot of supplements before then. People have understood that this is a highly beneficial molecule, but what they don't understand is that it's not bioavailable. But during the pandemic, quercetin and vitamin D cells skyrocketed because there are very specific studies on quercetin in vitro regarding different viruses. But again, people were flushing their money down the toilet because it's not bioavailable, okay? It's not. Uh, less than 1%. So unless you have some type of advanced delivery technology, unless you are uh, wrapping it in a liposome or creating a nanoparticle or doing something like the oral dissolvable strips, which is also a type of nanotechnology, or injecting it in the form of like an IV or, or a injectable, what's called sub-Q or subcutaneous injection, you're not getting the benefits of quercetin. So you just can't go out there and buy any dietary supplement with quercetin in it and think, oh, this is gonna be beneficial for me because I watched Tracy's live and he said quercetin's awesome. Quercetin's awesome if you have an advanced bioavailability enhancing technology, okay? What I like to call the BET, B-E-T. You can bet it's getting into your bloodstream if you have a bioavailability enhancing technique or technology, all right? So uh, another interesting thing about quercetin is it's got a very, very short half-life once it enters the human bloodstream. In fact, it's about two and a half hours is all. Now, quercetin breaks down into different, about four different specific compounds after that two and a half hours. And those compounds also have benefits. And I'll talk about those benefits a little bit later. But just know that quercetin is not going to float in your bloodstream or be in your body very long. So when I cite some of these studies later on and say that quercetin does this and quercetin has been shown to do that, just know that if you are taking a highly bioavailable form of quercetin, you might want to take it every three hours to keep quercetin in your bloodstream. So for example, if you've got like a cold or if you're fighting off a virus or something like that, go ahead and take an, a, a bioavailability enhanced technology form of quercetin every three hours to keep that in your bloodstream and keep the active properties in there so it can be beneficial for you. So it's not just about the type of molecule, but how you take that molecule that's important too and when you take that molecule. So just understand that quercetin has a very short half-life, meaning it doesn't stay active in the bloodstream very long before the body metabolizes it, all right? Let's get moving on to some of the cool... Um, well, no, I'm going to, we're going to, I, I want to say a few more things about quercetin first. I have mentioned that there are literally hundreds of different clinical studies on quercetin. Many of those studies are in vivo in both humans and animals. The majority of the studies are in vitro. And just so you know the differences between those two, in vivo means working inside the human body, Okay. In vitro means outside of the body, like their Petri dish studies. Now, those are important, but they're only important. In vitro studies are important to give you a hypothesis, a theory. A, hey, this looks like it could work. Now let's study it inside the body in vivo. So it's really important that you, when you read a clinical study, that you're looking at studies that are in vivo first and foremost. The best are in vivo human studies, but you can also have in vivo porcine studies, in vivo mice studies, because depending on the system, uh, it, it could be and is very similar to humans. Um, I mean, you guys, from a DNA standpoint and how cellular structures work and everything, our DNA is not that different from many, many other species out there. It doesn't have to be another primate. For example, a rat's digestive system is very similar to a human's digestive system with some small exceptions. Uh, same with the dogs. A primate's digestive system is near identical to a human digestive system. So it, it, depending on the type of study, but just look for like in vivo studies when you're trying to read 
about a particular ingredient or product's efficacy or not. If it's all in vitro studies, mm, you can get maybe a clear theory that something might work for you, but it's not irrefutable proof. An in vivo study, on the other hand, is very solid, all right? <clears throat> so I'm going to read off some in vivo studies that have been done on quercetin. I'm going to get into them later on in detail, but I'm just going to read off Right now, quercetin has been shown to be effective in vivo for antibacterial activity, okay? Reducing biofilms in the body, that's super important, especially in the digestive tract. Anti-tumor activity, uh, antigen reprogrammer, and that's what I'm going to get into in depth later. I think that's why quercetin was so popular during the pandemic, because it actually showed that it can take certain antigens and either suppress them or boost them according to need. I'm not going to say quercetin is adaptogenic. It is not considered an adaptogenic compound. But in some in vivo studies, it's shown that it can reprogram specific antigens. Antigens, by the way, if you're not familiar um, with what an antigen is, it's what your body produces against certain things. Those certain things mostly are foreign invaders, okay, into your body, things that shouldn't be in your body. I'll get it, you know, I'll get, no, I'll go ahead and go get into detail right now. You've got really cool cells inside your body called eosinophils. They're part of your immune system. We have basically four, we have a fifth one, but the fifth one's bad. Four major categories of white blood cells in our body. Sorry, granulo white blood cells. These are white blood cells that are like floating around in your bloodstream. I'm not talking about lymphocytes. We'll talk about those later. But you have basically basophils, uh, neutrophils, eosinophils, and hypersegmentated neutrophils, things like that, right? Each one of those has a specific function, but the eosinophil in particular, if you think of like special forces units in the military, there are kind of frontline, not so much fighters. They do more recon than fighting because they're not a huge force, right? Eosinophils, think of them as like the recon guy who's got this laser spotter and he can shoot a laser onto a target a couple miles away so that a, a cruise ship 50 miles off the coast can launch a missile 50 miles away and it'll be laser guided and it'll hit that target. And it's because there's some stealth guy who's out there in the grass in his ghillie suit, you know, targeting something. Eosinophils are like that guy. They go around your body and they mark with a hormone things that are not you, all right? That's what the eosinophil's job. And then that hormone is recognized by T cells and B cells. And they're like your... They're like your, you know, SEAL Team 6. They go in and take you out. That's like your, what we call natural killer SEAL uh, cells, all right? Yeah, maybe <laughs> Navy SEALs, but either way, they find those things that have been marked and then they attack it. So what quercetin can do is it can take those hormones that eosinophils mark with and they can change them. And they can either make those hormones friendly or make them bad depending on what it is they're targeting. And for example, you've all heard the word spike or cytokine storm from the spike protein that was all happening during the pandemic and all everything. That cytokine storm is because the vax somehow caused this, this massive antigen storm that happens in your body when you're exposed to the virus after you've been vaxxed. And that's what was causing a lot of the deaths, the post-vaccinated deaths, was this cytokine storm. The studies showed that quercetin can calm that cytokine storm by changing or reprogramming the antigen structure to where that wouldn't happen. In this was literally in vivo studies in patients. Okay, so it's crazy. Uh, quercetin is just this amazing molecule. But let let me go on to say that quercetin as a supplement in 2010, 
so we're talking 14 years ago, was so well studied and so well proven to be safe that the FDA, the US FDA, gave it a grass rating. Grass, it has nothing to do with the grass on your lawn. It's an acronym for generally regarded as safe. Something is only generally regarded as safe, meaning it has very little to no drug contraindications. It's got no human toxicity. Uh, it's got no uh, uh, side effects when taken. So quercetin is grass rated at up to 500 milligrams. Now I said most of the efficacy studies are like between 25, 50, 100 milligrams. So think about that. You could take five times or more the regular dose and it's still grass rated. It's still regarded as safe. That's how amazing this molecule is and why it made my list. Uh, uh, you know, number three is miracle molecules that I was going to talk about. Now, I'm going to quote and cite some of these studies here for you. Let's just talk about some of these. In a study published um, March 9th, 2010, in the Journal of Allergy, Asthma, and uh, Immunol, quercetin, when taken daily, effectively quells peanut-induced allergies. I... This is one of my pet peeves, you guys, because I travel a lot and I'm on airplanes a lot. It drives me so nuts when the announcer on the airplane, and, and by the way, I'm a snacker, like I carry snacks on the airplane, and they're usually granola bars or my nut bars or peanuts or trail mix or something like that. And then they get on the airplane and they say, we're sorry, passengers, we won't be having our snack service today because someone on the airplane has a nut allergy. And I'm like, oh my gosh, here's my two problems. Number one, if you have that severe an allergy, then carry a freaking EpiPen with you, but don't put everyone else around you. Don't disrupt their lives just because of your problem. You know, carry an EpiPen. Uh, and number two, if you do have that severe of a peanut allergy, freaking take quercetin. You should have informed yourself already and saw the studies on the internet and known that this study that was published in 2015 existed. Man, if I had that bad of an allergy, I'd be on the freaking internet every day, all day long, trying to solve my allergy. And it's solvable. Sorry, I quoted wrong. March 9th, 2010, not 2015. In the Journal of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunol, quercetin, when taken daily, effectively quells peanut-induced anaphylactic reactions. You won't go into anaphylactic uh, uh, shock when you take quercetin regularly if you've got nut allergies, all right? Here's another human study published October of 2015. Quercetin was found to increase T lymphocytes at doses as low as 50 to 100 micrograms. I already mentioned kind of what T cells and B cells are. They're the other types of white blood cells that we call lymphocytes. They're like your SEAL Team 6 guys. They're your natural killer cells. They go in, they get the job done. They kill viruses, they kill bacteria, all that stuff, all right? So it boosts T cell activity at as low as 50 to 100 micrograms. Here's another study published in May of 2016. Quercetin was found to decrease pro-inflammatory cytokines. This is the study that I talked about later, okay? The, the interesting thing, you guys, is this, this study was published in May of 2016, four full years before the pandemic. So don't tell me that there weren't doctors out there that knew this and knew how to solve this cytokine storm. They were just suppressed, most likely, all right? But yes, it, it balances and restrains the antigen-specific antibody formation. Uh, and if you don't know what that means, it basically means suppresses the cytokine storm that happens when when too many uh, antigens or when your body reacts, overreacts to specific antigens, all right? Uh, this same study showed that it's also effective in the inhibition of enzymes such as uh, <clears throat> lipoxygenase, eosinophil, and uh, paradoxase, and the suppression of inflammatory mediators. So I've already covered in Miracle Molecule Part 1 about specific anti-inflammatory markers and an ingredient, the curcumin that we talked about, that is a great uh, anti-inflammatory, uh, a natural anti-inflammatory. And now they're finding that quercetin may have similar properties uh, in certain inflammation pathways. There are 
lots of different ways you can get inflammation in the body and quercetin will help one of those and that's that uh, peroxidase enzyme um, by suppressing that. Anyway, the studies go on and on, you guys. I hope my team out there has posted some of these studies that, uh, and by the way, the studies that I mentioned are not the same studies that they'll be posting. There's many, many more you can search out there. Um, when I take a quercetin supplement, I already talked about bioavailability enhancing technologies. So I look for a quercetin that has a bioavailability enhancing technology. I happen to take Shield from obviously the product and the company that uh, I am co-founder of LifeWise because I have a good supply of quercetin in that dissolvable oral strip and it gets to my bloodstream faster, which means it's going to be in my bloodstream for a longer period of time Given that it has an extremely short half-life, I want it to be in there as long as possible and skip that first pass, you know, the digestive system and all the stuff that, that can be damaged through the digestive process. So when you're looking for a good quercetin supplement, look for something that, again, has that bioavailability enhancing technology. Look for something that is quick, fast-acting, can get into your bloodstream quicker. You know, and in all honesty, the best way to get it is subcutaneous, like go get a shot, but you'd have to go to your doctor and you're going to pay hundreds of dollars for that. But to get it in your bloodstream fastest, there's no better way. The next best way is those oral dissolvable strips. Uh, that's what I would consider the next best thing. So do your homework. Feel free to reach out to me, ask me any questions. Everyone knows that you can reach me uh, on Facebook in Messenger. Um, I've also done trainings on that particular product shield on the LifeWise YouTube channel. If you have not been to the LifeWise YouTube channel, go to YouTube on the search tab, type in LifeWise group, find the little logo with the tree, that's ours, and you will be able to see every video we've ever created and almost every Facebook Live I've ever done, you'll be able to find that. Um, please refer to the person who maybe sent you my link but talk to them where you can find a great uh, form of quercetin. And thank you for joining me tonight. And I will see you next week, Tuesday, for part four of Miracle Molecule, where the molecule that I'm going to be addressing next week on part four is pretty cool. It's relatively new. It's super exciting. That's the only hints I'm going to give you now. But tell everyone to join me. They're going to love it. Have a good evening. Bye.